Here, I'll tell you how I got sober, man. Let's just, we'll get into it. You know, I've been talking about it for a while, and there's never really like a right time to talk about that sort of thing, but I do want to be able to share it with you guys. Because sometimes people ask about it and wonder what's up, and then, you know, I'll just tell you how I got into that. So, you know, I was born, I was born, my father was an old man. My dad was 70 years old when I was born, and my mother was 32. And um, and they had four children. And, you know, when I was born, I think there was some shame or uncertainty by my parents. They had me call my dad by his first name instead of calling him dad. Because I guess maybe they'd gotten a lot of, you know, strange looks from people or, or judgment. And maybe they felt like that was a way that would make it easier on them and maybe on us too. But my father was very old when I was born. And as I started to get to know him, I was just kind of scared because, you know, he was a senior citizen and, and he just kept getting older. Like as I was getting older, he was getting older. And I remember, you know, when he went going to walk in a church one time and I had to like walk him, like make sure he was okay where he was stepping. And, uh, you know, just what the concrete was like. And so he didn't, you know, trip and that sort of thing. And so it just made me, I think, hyper aware when I was really young, I was very aware. And my mother worked a lot and, um, and she wasn't really connected to me. You know, she just worked a lot. And she had to work. You know, she had four children. And my parents got divorced. And we lived in like a... And we moved to like a poor area. And... And I guess I just started to feel like ashamed. You know, I felt ashamed of the fact that my family was poor. I felt ashamed that my dad was old and couldn't you know couldn't be like as much a part of my life in a lot of ways because physically it was hampering to him and then because my parents were separated and then he wasn't around and you know I, I and I started making up stories you know, I would tell people stories to make my life different than it was you know I would tell people you know I would take the school bus sometimes to a different neighborhood and get dropped off and then walk because I didn't want people to see where I lived. And I would start riding my bike to school. I'd ride my bike maybe five miles to school when I was in middle school. You know, and that's fifth grade. And maybe that's not wild, but at the time it didn't feel wild to me. You know, it felt like this is what I need to do to feel okay. So, you know, my peers won't judge me or... And they may not even have been judging me. I just felt, I don't know, I guess I just felt judged. I felt less than. I felt, I don't know. Honestly, I didn't know. Sometimes I didn't really feel anything. But I knew that if I showed up at school on the poor bus, then people knew I was poor. And, and, And I already felt bad enough because nobody was telling me in my world, like one of my parents, that I could feel okay about myself. You know, I didn't have my, you know, there wasn't a father around. And this isn't a sob story I'm trying to tell you guys. I'm trying to tell you how I ended up getting into uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. For me, I'm not saying you need to do this. I don't know your life. I don't know your world. If you were doing an eight ball right now and listening to this, bro, and eating, you know, and eating somebody's butt, you matter, whatever, do your thing. I'm not judging you at all, man. I wish I was right there with you. One day I may be back. But for now, this is where I am. So I just felt, you know, I just felt less than. I felt, I didn't I didn't know anything about myself, how to feel good about myself. So the only way I knew to feel good was if I could make you like me. I needed, like I needed you I only decided how I felt based on how you felt about me 
and it went from moment to moment. And so I was a storyteller because I wanted my life to be different to other people. And so I told stories. And and also I, I liked making people laugh because I knew that if they were laughing, then they 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 were okay with me. You know that they, they couldn't be hating me and laughing at the same time. Um, my sister, I had a younger sister who was very ill. She was born with a rare liver disease, and she needed a liver transplant upon her birth. And so. When my mother did have free time, a lot of time my sister got the affection because she was ill. Um, And she got a lot more love and affection than my brothers and sister, my other brother and my other sister did, I felt like. Anyhow, I was, you know, growing up and one thing I really loved was summertime, I would go to YMCA summer camp. And at summer camp, things weren't as clicky everybody was on the same page it was it was a group of kids in the summer that just wanted to have fun we got to do fun stuff we all you know rode on a bus uh together from the camp to go to field trips and i just loved that and you know our and 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 people didn't it just just wasn't as judgmental you know my mom would drop us off there and we'd stay there and go to summer camp and we weren't, it just felt like less judgment. And one day I was, um, I was walking uh, in my neighborhood and one of the counselors from my uh, summer camp drove down the street. He was, happened to be driving through my neighborhood and he saw me in this neighborhood. And it was a, you know, our neighborhood was poor, man. It was, you know, I think it was the poorest white neighborhood that was around us, I felt like. And that, And then when I saw him at summer camp, he was joking with some of the other counselors. He was making fun of where I lived. He was making fun of, uh, you know, he was making fun of the place he saw me run out of, the apartment I ran out of. And, And it just, at that point, like a lot, something inside of me just really kind of died, something, you know, like here was this one place where I really felt kind of okay and now that place didn't feel okay to me anymore so um you know so high school went on and god gave me some good gifts and i was a storyteller and you know i was always concerned though like uh you know i always needed to be around more people or everything was always started to be you know we need to change this we need to do that i'd go to a party and then i'd have to go to another part like where's the party but we're at the party something never felt kind of okay um i just never felt okay i always felt like i was trying to make things okay and things weren't bad i had some great times i was fun i was having fun but on the inside i was i didn't know who i was at all i didn't have any beliefs i didn't have any real values um and I, how I felt about me was based upon how you felt about me. And when I was 14, I got emancipated. You know, I couldn't live at my family's home anymore. My brother had moved away to live with my grandparents, and he and I weren't close. And and I and after he'd moved away, you know, I'd been I'd spent a lot of time in our room by myself, and it made me I think real sad because my brother's bed was in there and my bed was in there. You know, in every kind of like year, every six months, he would say, you know, or my mom would say he might come back and live with us again. And he didn't come back. You know, and I don't fault him for it or anything. He, you know, he had his own walk with our environment and um, he needed to find a place for him to be well. And uh, and he's gotten very well over the years. And uh, and anyhow, so, but it, it, it all like, I was just in this room and I wanted things to be different and I was a scared kid, you know? And this is before I, I moved out of my mother's home and I just remember being really scared. I wanted to, I remember being at night, that, uh, you know, our neighborhood was scary and it was just, um, we grew up like it was, you know, kind of poor white and poor black was like right over from us. And it was just, you know, it was scary. 
when people get real impoverished, like things get scary. Um, and I was just scared. And at night I would, dude, I was a scared kid. I remember like I would wet the bed all the time, you know? And I remember, uh, I remember there was a, um, one time when I was young, I heard that if an animal had urinated somewhere that other animals couldn't come get that animal. And so I remember at that point, sometimes I would urinate off my bed, around my bed in a big circle at night so that things couldn't come get me. Um, you know, I was just creating this crazy like world inside of me that was a lot of fear and there was a lot of uncertainty and there was not a lot of systems inside of myself to make myself feel okay. Um, and my mother and I were just disconnected, man. You know, she gave us birthdays and she gave us holidays, uh, but she had to work hard. And I think that she, you know, I don't know. I don't know if she had the tools really to make me feel loved, you know? So anyhow, I got emancipated at 14. I ended up living with a family for the first time. I had my own room and I had peace. I had some peace in my life. I mean, just like moments where I just felt like, uh, like I could relax a little bit. Um, but this, but this thing inside of me of not feeling okay was still very much there. And, you know, I developed issues with women where, you know, I had a really tough time relating to women and, and, and trusting women and feeling okay and, and really being able to commit to relationships. And at some point, you know, life went on, things were going okay. Um, but I started using at some point uh, cocaine a little bit. And I liked cocaine because I would get it and do it by myself at home, at night. And I would just do it, at, uh, and it just made me feel good, and I didn't have to be around other people. And I don't know, it just made me feel something. It made me feel something. I mean, for so long inside of myself, I'd had so many years, really, of creating my own feelings on the outside of me, but not really having them inside of me. You know, like... I just didn't have feelings inside. Like I just, if I wanted to feel something, I had to think it up and then act it out and display it as I'd seen it displayed in like television or movies or from others. But the inside of me, there wasn't a lot going on. Um, so anyhow, like the, you know, and I wasn't getting crazy into drugs or anything like that, but I had one night where I ended up in a taxi cab and a woman said something to me, kind of rejected me in like a mean way um and i hadn't done anything wild i just you know had you know at, you know expressed some interest and she expressed interest and then i returned the expression and then she uh was mean to me um and she didn't reject me rejection is fine but she was mean to me also and next thing you know uh the taxi driver dropped her off we were in a taxi and next thing you know i end up with the taxi driver four hours later me and him are doing cocaine together and and i'm driving the taxi and he's in the back he's in the back with an escort he bought me an escort i don't want no escort you know luigi that was the guy's name and we're in north harlem and i'm driving a taxi and the meter is still running i'm still paying for that taxi and uh and that morning, I was in New York because I had to be on, I was in New York, I, I, I had to be on a, a big radio show called the Opie and Jim Norton radio show. And they had like a million listeners and it was a huge opportunity. And if you'd asked me the night before, hey man, are you going to stay up all night partying before you go into the radio? I'd have said, no way. I would never do that. And then here I was in this moment and it's 5 a.m. I got to go to the radio, you know? I mean, I got to my hotel after driving taxi and then paying for it. Dude, just blown out of my mind, dude. I couldn't feel my face with either hand. At first, I thought something was wrong with my hands, but then I realized something wrong with my face. And, uh, and I get to the radio station. Dude, I took three showers in 10 minutes before I went there. So you know you want some really you know, some svelte dust if you're taking three showers in 10 minutes and drying off between each one. And that's cocaine, papa. And I get to the radio station 
and uh, the other guest, for, and I can't even talk. And uh, and the other guest for the day was Daryl Strawberry, who was um, a Hall of Fame baseball player. And he's you can look him up, and he's one of the greatest baseball players ever. But he his career was really altered by cocaine. And here he was. I was on the radio with him. I had collected his cards when I was young, and I couldn't even talk. The main gift that that God had given me was my voice, and I couldn't even use it because I'd been up all night just using drugs to feel good somehow or using drugs to feel anything and um and that was crazy because i'd always thought in my head oh so daryl strawberry you think you thought about him and you thought oh he's on drugs he's this and that he ruined his life but then here he was in front of me he was 13 years sober he was eloquent successful and i mean he was a dang king sitting in front of me and at one moment that's where some things lined up in my life that's where some things lined up in my mind and said, oh, hey, look, here you are with this gift you think you have that you can communicate. You can't even talk because you fucked up, bruh, because you've been out driving taxi. Um, and here you are with somebody who you thought or had judged as being fucked up. And here he is a king. And it just lined things up in a perfect moment where I just had this moment of like, oh, I need to something needs to change for me and the next day I was back in Los Angeles I was telling that same story to someone and they said hey man I go to these meetings you know I go to meetings and so then I went to uh some AA meetings and you know and for the first time in my life I sat down and listened to people tell stories which were my favorite thing to hear my whole life I'd been loving stories man I love your story. You know, whatever your story is, I love it, man. I lo Because all my life when I was young, I just wanted a different story. I wanted a different story. Whether I had to tell it or try and live yours, whether I had to get emancipated and come live at your house or this house or that house, I just wanted a different story, man. I wanted to be, I wanted to be in a family and I wanted to feel loved, you know? You know, I just really, I mean, I think, and I didn't even know it. I didn't know how much I wanted to, uh, how much I wanted to be loved, man. I just didn't even know it. And once I got into these rooms, I could, you had to sit there, you had to be quiet and you had to hear other people. And people started talking and telling their stories. And for the first time in my life, they were telling emotional, like, tales of that were exciting and fucking dope and like deep and real and I connected with that I loved it you know I loved it and that and so I just kept going I just kept going and next thing you know I was like next thing you know I had a couple nights in a row or a couple weeks in a row or months in a row where I was spending time with other people and I was meeting people and I and, and like suddenly Los Angeles became like this place that I'd always kind of hated and judged it became a little bit I still don't like that place people are out of their fucking minds out there a bunch of disconnected kooks judging most of the uh, the rest of America but it also made me it gave me a place to kind of it just gave me friends it gave me people and because I knew those people had had struggles, I knew that they'd felt some of the same ways that I felt inside. Uh, I couldn't judge those people, you know? Um, even though sometimes I wanted to. You know, you'd have a dude come in and like, you know, uh, and it, you know, he'd lost his family or he, you know, he'd, he'd lost his kids and been taken away by the courts and he's drinking or a woman who'd, addicted to heroin and she's you know hadn't seen it. and finally they're getting their lives back together and you just you know they say like listen for the similarities not the differences and I always want in my life sometimes I'd always wanted to listen for differences because differences gave me an ability to separate me from other people and if I'm just me by myself then I know that I'm I'm okay because it's the only thing I've ever known the only way I've ever been okay really is by being by myself. I don't know an okay where I'm attached to others. You know, where I trust others at like a a place deeper than my own feelings. A place that I don't really know. 
But for the first time in these rooms, I could do it. You know, for the first time in these rooms, like I started like, man, I had love for people that I did not even know. And then in moments, and still this stuff kind of comes slow, but I start to have love for myself, you know. And the hardest thing for me to do in my life has been to love myself because, you know, somewhere in my life, in my story, or when I was young, or I don't know when, you know, I think just because of, you know, maybe my, you know, dad being so old and, you know, my mom not feeling like my mother cared about me or whatever. It's not a sob story. I'm not telling you that, but I'm just telling you that. I never really loved myself because I'd never really loved myself because uh, somewhere in my past and like a long time before that, I guess I, you know, I just had felt like I wasn't worth it. You know, and it's sad. It's tough to kind of admit some of that, but, uh, and it wasn't a choice I made even like consciously. It's not like somebody said, Hey, are you worth loving yourself? I would have said yes. But somewhere deeper than that, like somewhere when I was young or when I don't know, but just somewhere before that, you know, I just decided that I wasn't, you know, I just looked at my surroundings and I don't know. I just had felt or my life or whatever the recipe was that was in my life. I looked at that. And um, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, you're not, you don't deserve, or you're not good, or you're bad, you're a bad person, or something. I don't know. I still don't know. You know, uh, there's still a lot for me to learn. Anyway, this story is a little bit emotional for me, but you know, it's this is the story that I tell. And so since I got into uh, going to meetings and stuff like that, and look, I wasn't a cokehead. I have friends that are cokeheads. I experienced, I mean, my Coke use was probably, it was over a, a couple of years, maybe once every few months, maybe three times a year, four times a year. But then there was a point over about three weeks or maybe six weeks, I don't know, where it had escalated. And it was just kind of like, it was like once a week. And then it was like, you know, the last two weeks, it was like two or three times a week, you know? Um, I mean, I'm pissed. Sometimes I'm like, fuck, I wish I never even got to smoke crack. You know, I don't want to be a crackhead, but fuck. You know, I'll take, you know, I'll take a hit or two just to see, you know, what everybody's talking about down at the bus at the, uh, down at the Greyhound, you know. But since then, you know, in this program, I've learned like, uh, you know, I've just, I don't feel alone. I, I don't feel as alone as I used to, and I'm learning to have different feelings about myself and different ways to think about myself. Um, and it's a program of action, though. Like I have to work and I have to like go to you know some of these meetings. And I go to the meetings, man. It's so funny that God used or my higher power. People say higher power, God, whatever. Um, you know, I believe in God. I believe in God. You know, and so much out here in like uh, this business I'm in, they try to like make you feel like you it's not cool to do that but uh, I'm not going to feel that way for me um, because I need that you know in the program too that you know the AA it's cool because they it's not about the drugs and alcohol man you know I never liked drinking I never I was never you know I was never a pothead I was never I just started to see like oh man if you'd asked me one day, will you go to this great opportunity you have on this radio station with, you know, one of the biggest radio stations, radio shows in the world, would you go on that fucked up? I'd have said, no way. And then here I was doing something that I wouldn't have done. So that's when I realized, like, you know, I just wasn't, I wasn't even doing things that I really wanted to be doing. Um, and now my life has gotten better, man. Uh, it really has. Um, and sometimes I don't even want to admit that. You know, there's something inside of me sometimes that wants to make me separate from other people, you know? There's something that wants to make me alone. 
because it's part of the only way that I ever knew how to be. Um, and man, it has been a journey. Nothing with dr- the drugs and alcohol has been whatever. You know, I may get, you know, I may, I don't know if I'll always be sober. I have no idea. But the thing that keeps me involved is, man, I get, I get to learn so much about myself, about loving others, about uh, acceptance. Um, it's introduced me to other issues that I have that, you know, maybe drugs and alcohol aren't even my issue. Um, it's just introduced me into a world of like introspection. Like for the first time I can take a look at myself and, uh, and I still look, I got a ton of faults. I'm not, um, but I know that if I stay like on this path, that things can get better. I believe that because there's proof for me, you know, my career has gotten better. Um, you know, I've met people that have loved me, uh, you know, I've been I've been in in and out of a relationship with somebody that loved me. You know, and for one of the first times in my life that I really felt that. Not that other people hadn't loved me in the past, but this was the first time I could feel it. You know, and it's just because something had changed inside of me, where you know, where I didn't need to just have all these walls up or whatever to survive anymore like you know I think my higher power wants to tell me look man you're going to be okay Um, you know you can take a break you know and uh, anyway you know I don't know um, you know I don't know if I'll always be a part of this program or not but You know, for the first time in my life, like this story, like that's a, you know, I can tell you a true story. You know, all the years of like having to lie and like, you know, be ashamed of who I was or what I was or anything or anything like that. Like, um, it's still okay to tell stories. It's okay to create and be, you know, want to bring people together and, and be a storyteller and think about things. And that's all okay. But for the first time in my life, I have a little bit of a story of my own. You know, and there are moments, you know, not always, but there's moments where I don't feel as ashamed of myself as I did for so long, man. You know, I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed of myself for things I didn't even nothing, really, for nothing. Just because at a young age nobody had told me not to be ashamed of myself. You know, nobody had told me, "Hey, man, you're okay." You know, nobody had told me, "Hey, man, you are o." Oh, Okay. And you're not a bad person. So, and that's what that's what keeps me coming back to these programs, man, and the shit is lit. And it's fun, man, and every time I go I get to hear a story that makes me feel. It makes me realize that I have a heart and that I'm a loving person. Because for so much of my life I wanted to know that about myself, and now I go into these rooms and I hear other people's stories, and it, and I feel a certain way, and it and there is proof right there inside of me, living inside of my body through feeling and through love, and that's dope, man. This shit is fucking dope. And so that's kind of where I'm at, man. I would um, it's 11 p.m. now here on uh, and I had some calls, man. Look, I want to play one or two calls that came in. Uh, and I'm sorry, look, you know, I'm not sorry about my story, but I'm sorry, you know, I had a headache. I didn't want to tell that story tonight um, because I wanted to be, be able to tell it best as I could. Uh, and it's hard to think sometimes when your head is uh, hurting, you know. But, you know, my relationships have gotten better these days. You know, my brother and I, I mean, he's, I'm so close to my brother these days, like it's, uh, you know, it's wild. You know, and, you know, and I've met like a couple of the greatest people I've ever met, like through AA. You know, I've learned about like unconditional love and things like that. Not things that I'm able to practice yet, but at least for the first time in my life, you know, I'm I'm aware of some of these things. And, uh, and more will be revealed, man. That's what they say in that program. More will be revealed. You know, when you can develop a relationship with a higher power, you can do what you want. They got coffee. They got shitty cookies. You know, it's a fucking trap house, but where people get together to share good time. 
real time. And it, look, it's just like the comedy club this weekend, man. Dude, you could in one room you could you probably could have bought a gram in there. But in that other room, dude, we made some damn magic this weekend. But we lit that motherfucker on fire. And I am uh I'm grateful to everybody that came out. It's the holidays. You know, I'm so excited, man. I get to go home. You know? I mean, I have a fam. I have like, I got five nieces and nephews today that love me. You know? And even if they don't, I get to watch like my siblings be parents. You know, I get to watch my siblings love their children in a way that we never got to experience. And I'm awake for that. And, uh, and that's cool, man. That for me, man, this shit is a, this shit is a ride, bro. This shit is a ride. So I know this shit got a little bit emo on this episode and I know it looks like I'm interrogated. This is not an, this is not an ISIS interrogation video. If you look it on YouTube, it really looks like a trap house, but, um, but you know, I feel you know, I, and I don't, sometimes they say, you know, you're not supposed to talk about sobriety in a public forum and stuff like that, but whatever, man. You know, I've never been somebody to break, to follow really the rules, I don't think. Uh, and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. But I'm so grateful to everybody that came out this weekend because they changed my experience. You know, on Thursday I was kind of stressed, or Friday I was like, ah, this place. And by the end I was like, man, it doesn't matter where we are. You know, at our shows, we have a good time. And we do it as, you know, at a fair price. And uh, and I'm grateful, man. I'm grateful to the group of people that I get to be a part of now, even at my own shows. You know, at our shows, we get to do that. And I feel like we're going to do a lot of cool stuff in the coming year to help others. And, um, and I just appreciate it, man. You know what's interesting, too, for me is like, this podcast, a lot of times, even over the years, like maybe there was a time or two on what I thought on a Saturday night, man, I'm gonna get fucked up, you know? But then I had to be here for this podcast on Sunday. And so, you know, I don't know. Maybe, you know, you guys kept me out of the dark sometimes here and there. And again, if you're partying, you're drinking, you're getting fucked up, if I'm at your house, you're doing coke, I don't care, that's fine. If y'all shooting up, I'm leaving, bro, okay? If you needling, if you fucking wrote haystack on your arm and you fucking needling yourself, I'm out, daddy. But if you guys, you know, your cousin's on fucking nine Tylenol and y'all blowing a blunt in the garage, bro, I'm fine. You know, I don't care if you drink. I don't care if you fucking, you know, pour meth down your fucking stepdad's, you know, esophagus. But that's okay. You can do whatever. You don't have to adjust any of your life. For me, anything like that. People don't need to be, there's nothing, you don't have to be weird around these kind of people. You know, my biggest problem, I realized it wasn't with drugs or alcohol. My biggest problem was with the way that I felt. And I am relieved of some of that. And I'm learning more all the time, man. And that's where I'm at. You know, that's where I'm at. And I'm so thankful that in a weird way, like all those times of storytelling and lying to people and just, you know, I just wanted to feel seem okay to them, you know? You know, make lying about, you know, where my dad was or who he was or, you know, lying about why I was walking through somebody's neighborhood after school because I didn't even live in that neighborhood, you know? And just, uh, just all kind of stuff, man. You know, um, it's interesting because all that time of storytelling now, you know, the things that, uh, that didn't serve me before now it serves me now i'm able to go to a place and t you know and share stories so i mean i think you know god works in mysterious ways man and also in unmysterious ways but also in way my fucking mysterious ways <laughs>